Brothers and sisters, delighted to be with you this day. I like prophecy. Do you like prophecy? I, I discovered prophecy when I was in seminary. I, I come from a home that was not particularly active, and therefore I was not raised in the scriptures and in scriptural tradition. And therefore going to seminary and finding out that God knew the future was absolutely thrilling to me. God knows the future. That is wonderful. I, I learned this uh, from a seminary teacher. The great Jehovah contemplated the whole of the events connected with the earth pertaining to the plan of salvation before it rolled into existence or ever the morning stars sang together for joy. The past, the present, and the future were and are with him one eternal now. Ooh, I wondered, what did that mean? And particularly, what did it mean so far as the greatness and power of God was concerned for me? And I think that's the reason that I like prophecy. It said something to me that I needed to hear, and that was, God is not only the God of the past. People really do like the God of the past. They like the God of the past a lot. That's the guy who, uh, the God who opened the Red Sea, the one who brings Israel into the land, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, all the great prophets. I like the God of the past. Most people like the God of the past. But he is not only God of the past, he is also the God of the present. I can tell you that my students really like the God of the present. They like to know that he is there. Every time I give a test, I can tell they like the God of the present because there's always just a little fervent moment of contact with the God of the present before they dip into, uh, into these things. But for me, what was exciting is that God is also the God of the future. That as he is the God of the past and as he is the God of the future, so too he holds and controls the future, which meant to me that my God could be a God in whom I could have absolute faith. He knew the future. And further, I was thrilled to know that he would reveal that future unto his servants, the prophets. Isn't that what it says in, in Amos? Surely the God, Lord God will do nothing. But he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. By the way, just an aside. Having studied prophecy for a long time, I can tell you that all the prophecies are in agreement that though the last days may look bleak for a period, God is going to win the battle. The game is his. The score has already been posted, and guess what? God won. On that basis, I can relate to something that Elder Holland said, which was we're playing a very strange game here. The score has already been posted. God wins, the devil loses, but we're all out on the playing field trying to decide which uniform to wear. Now for me, I like prophecy because it tells me which uniform I can wear if I really want to be on the winning team. Now as I studied prophecy and took a look at the Lord's revelation to his children about future events, I was very impressed that he's willing to tell us about the second coming even the when of the second coming. Uh, I, I know that causes a little bit of heartburn. Some have concluded because of some statements the Lord made that we are all going to be uh, surprised out of our socks, as it were, with the Lord's second coming. Uh, he said to his apostles, this is during the Sermon on the Mount, that the day and the hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels of God in heaven, but my Father only. In... Uh, Eight, uh, March of 1831, he said to the prophet Joseph Smith, The hour and the day no man knoweth, neither the angels in heaven, nor shall they know until he comes. Suggesting that not even the angels are going to know until the very moment. In other words, not only are people on earth going to be surprised, oh my goodness, people in heaven are going to be surprised as well. Ooh, what do you know? It's now. I am impressed with a statement that Joseph Smith made in the Nauvoo Temple. This was on April 6, 1843. 
his uh, scribes write thus, uh, quoting Joseph, did Christ speak this as a general principle through all generations that no one would know the hour? Oh no, he spoke in the present tense. No man that was then living upon the footstool of God who knew, uh, knew the day or the hour. But, did he, but he did not say that there would not be any man throughout all generations that should not know the day or the hour. No, for it would be in flat contradiction to the other scriptures. For the prophets say that the God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants the prophets. Consequently, if it is not made known unto the prophets, it will not happen. So, the prophets are indeed going to prepare us for the second coming. They will keep us abreast of everything that is going on. The Lord then, in section 106, gives us this admonition. And again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that ye may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. Oh, wonderful. We do not need to wonder the when and the where of the Lord's coming. He indeed will reveal it to us, he assures us. We should not be surprised that the Lord is willing to reveal the material. After all, this isn't the only time the Lord has ever showed up. There was a first coming. And I am impressed that the Lord revealed a great deal about that first coming and about the nature of the ministry that he would enjoy during that first coming. Therefore, I would suggest to you the first coming of the Lord provides us with a model of prophecy concerning the second coming of the Lord. If he told us things then about his first coming, then surely he will tell us things about his second coming. So let's take a look now at what the Lord revealed about his first coming. That wonderful period when, his, when he would minister as a mortal man on the earth. Now, due to time constraints, I'm going to focus our prophetic statements on the mortal ministry, or if you will, his ministry among the Jews. Uh, there's a reason for that. Whatever the Nephites knew about the Lord's mortal ministry, they would have to get from one of two sources, their scriptures or through direct revelation. And of course, the, revel the scriptures themselves are revelatory, so all they knew about the Lord and his first coming would indeed be through revelation, which tells me this. What we have in the Book of Mormon by way of description and outline of the Lord's first coming is what God considers to be the very most important people, uh, per, uh, excuse me, both most important principles that people could know. This then tells me how I interpret, how I translate, how I understand the Lord's ministry among the Jews. And so our topic this, after, or this morning then is the Lord's coming to the Jews uh, as seen through the power of the Book of Mormon. I am impressed with how much the Nephites knew. They knew where he would be conceived in Nazareth. They knew who his mother would be, Mary. They knew that it would be 600 years from the time Lehi left Jerusalem until this act would actually take place. And then they were warned again five years before the coming of the Lord that the event was actually going to take place. They understood the nature of the ministry. They had a general outline of the history of the ministry. And they knew that that ministry would end in death. Now, the detail of that prophecy caused those without faith some heartburn. There were those who just simply could not accept that a person could know the future. It was just too difficult. Sherem took Jacob to task for perverting the way of truth, he says, for promoting the worship of a being which ye say, which ye sh say shall come many hundreds of years hence. He assured Jacob that this is blasphemy, for no man knoweth of such things, for he cannot tell the things to come. Sherem's testimony was backed up by that of Korahor. He preached unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. He boldly asked, Why do ye look for a Christ? For no man can know anything which is to come. But the prophetic declaration and history of the Book of Mormon shows that people with such faith or such faithlessness will not prevail. Indeed, God will prevail, his prophecy will prevail, and therefore I would suggest to you that prophecy is sure, 
that prophecy is indeed secure. And those who put their faith in prophecy in the Book of Mormon were those that were fully prepared for the Lord's first coming. And that those who put their faith in prophecy at the time of the second coming will also be fully rewarded for their faithfulness. Well, what does the book then teach us about the first coming of Jesus to the Jews? First of all, the book teaches us that when he comes, he will come as the Son of God. Alma testified, by the, maybe I better just uh, interject something here. Because I am not doing uh, a block analysis, but rather pulling a piece here and a piece there and a piece over here and putting them together for, for this analysis, I'm not going to uh, be turning to the scriptures. Uh, they're just, I'm, I'm using over 89 scriptural references in this presentation, so I've just simply got to, to move through them. So. I won't be having you turn to the scriptures, but I will be quoting the scriptures a great deal on here. Okay, so Alma testifies that he shall be born of Mary, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Now, if there's one thing the Book of Mormon is absolutely dead center on, and that is Jesus is the Son of God in the flesh. He is unique in that he holds as his sire the God of heaven. An angel assured Nephi that Mary was the mother of Jesus, uh, excuse me, the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. That, that is an extremely striking statement to me. The great Jehovah, the creator of heaven and earth, the God that holds all things in his power, would enter mortality as any other baby enters mortality. Though his conception might be miraculous, his birth would not be. He would be born of a mortal woman in a mortal way into a mortal environment, and thus he would be very mortal. I, I find that the statement by King Benjamin is very apropos when he said that the Redeemer would dwell in a tabernacle of clay. Really, truly, he would be like us, coming into the world just the way you and I come into the world. Second, Though the son would fully, be fully mortal, he would not be just like us. He would be unique, something inimitable, something matchless in glory and power. He would be able to do things that no human was ever able to do. Though he might dwell in a tabernacle of clay, King Benjamin assures us that he would come with power and go forth among the children of men, working mighty miracles. This power would come as a direct result of his being, the scripture assures us, the only begotten of the Son of God. His conception and birth would allow him to remain, though fully mortal, also fully God. Abinadi said this, God himself shall come down among the children of men and take upon him the form of man and go forth in mighty power. I want you to notice that Abinadi does not say that Jesus will become a man. He says that, it, uh, that Jesus will take upon him the form of a man and under that form exercise tremendous power. Alma elaborated on this point saying that the Redeemer would take upon him the image of man. And it should be the image after which man was created in the beginning. Or in other words, he said that man was created in the image of God, and that God should come down among the children of men. So notice again, God's coming down. Guess what? He's going to look just like us. Or, better, we will find when he comes that we really truly do look like him. It will bonify the scripture that says we are created in the likeness and image of our God. The point is that Jesus stood apart from all others born of mortal men and women, even though he looked like us and we look like him, and even though he lived like us in our world, he was still something apart from us. It was because he was different that he could fulfill his mission, that mission given to him by the great Elohim, for he shall suffer temptations and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man can suffer, except it be unto death. For behold, blood cometh from every pore, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people, testified King Benjamin. Two important points come out of this scripture. First of all, it separates the Savior from a class of beings called man. 
No man can suffer these things, which means that Jesus must be something other than man. Second, his godly abilities allowed him to do what was necessary in order to go through the physical and spiritual tortures leading through to the atonement of all humankind. Amulek stresses the idea that Jesus was neither man nor human, that he was something more. Explaining the need for the great and last sacrifice, he said that it would, quote, not be a sacrifice of man, neither of beast, neither of any manner of fowl, for it shall not be a human sacrifice, but infinite and eternal. That's uh, Alma 34.10, and I, you can tell I'm emphasizing some points. You see what, what Amulek does is he emphasizes the point made by Abinadi, that Jesus is something other than man. Am, uh, Amulek divides mortal being into two categories. That which is not infinite and eternal, and then he says, this is man or this is human. And then that which is indeed infinite and eternal, and he says, this is not man, not human. Christ fell into this other category. He was infinite and he was indeed eternal. Jesus is the Son of God then was more than the rest of us because even when he was born he was infinite and eternal. Therefore he carried those attributes with him throughout mortality and Amulek could affirm that quote the great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God yea infinite and eternal. Third point the Book of Mormon shows us that though Jesus was something different than man, that is to say, he was something more than our finite, small, temporal being, but rather infinite, eternal, that did not mean that he could not relate to man, that he could not relate to those of us who were human. Indeed, Abinadi testified that because he was God and the Son of God, he was not shielded from temptations, nor was he shielded from sorrow. Alma knew that the Savior would, quote, go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and this, that the word might be fulfilled, which saith, he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. Notice, Jesus does something more than just simply atone for sin. He also shares with us our sicknesses, our infirmities, our depressions, the, the torture of soul as well as the torture of body. And further, that he took upon these things willingly himself, that he might extend to you and I the power by which we can get through these very kinds of things. Now there was a divine reason why the Lord was meant to feel what you and I feel that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he might know according to the flesh how to succor his people. Therefore, as the Spirit knoweth all things, for Jesus it was important that the flesh knoweth all things as well, therefore the scripture says that Christ shall suffer, yea, even according to the flesh. And remember, that he would suffer more than any man can suffer, save it be unto death. I, I am impressed that so many buy into a myth that must have been carefully written in hell and then edited in pur purgatory until it was just exactly right and then spread forth across the length and the breadth of the land and we've bought into it, and that is that good people know nothing or little about temptation. Brothers and sisters, nothing could be further from the truth. What does a bad man know about resisting temptation? Number one, he's never resisted. He's always given in. What does he know about the seductive power, the force, the height, the depth of temptation? When he is always giving in. No, it, 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 is, it is that man who holds out for a week or that woman who holds out for a month against the seductive power of temptation that knows something about temptation. And as C.S. Lewis said, because Christ never sinned, he knew all there was about the height and depth of temptation. And never having given in, he became the ultimate realist. Yeah, he is very real and understands our position in this very real world so far as temptation is concerned. And thus, Abinadi assures us that he could ascend into heaven having the bowels of mercy, 
being filled with compassion toward the children of men. Fourth point. Some knew that the Savior would come 600 years from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem. It was recorded in their scriptures. Nephi recorded it. They knew the date, but they did not measure, the Nephites did not measure their time from the prophecy. They used the usual system of measuring according to the reign of the kings or according to the reign of the judges. And therefore, as time passed, it may be that many did not know exactly when Jesus would come. They knew he would come. They may not have known exactly when. All that changed with the coming of Samuel the Lamanite. He told them the Lord would come in five years. Boy, is that specific? Five more years and the Lord cometh. And he gave the people a very specific sign by which they would know. He tells them that there would be one day and a night and a day as if it were one day and there should be no night. In addition, there shall be a new star arise, such as one as ye have never beheld. And by this, he insists, they would know that the Son of God has come to redeem all those who believe on his name. The Nephites taught that uh, there would be a number of years between the sign and the actual ministry of the Lord. In other words, the sign wouldn't be given and bang the next day. The Lord would be out doing his ministerial duties. No, there would be a number of years, but... Nephi understood what was going to happen during those crucial years before the Lord's ministry would begin. He says that during the period, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge, of, uh, knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he shall make him quick in understanding in the fear of the Lord. Wisdom, truth, power, fear of God. All of these things the Lord developed during those years when he was preparing for his mortal ministry. Fifth, the Book of Mormon testifies that before the beginning of his formal ministry, the Lord would indeed be baptized. Now, it's, I'm surprised how much information the Book of Mormon contains on this very important event. I'm not surprised that the event's important. I'm surprised that the Book of Mormon picks up with so many details. It's interesting that John is never mentioned by name. But the Book of Mormon prophets knew that he would baptize in Bethabara across Jordan. They knew something of the message that he would give, that he would teach the people of the coming Messiah, but that he would also teach them truths in the way of God. Further, he would testify, one cometh behind me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. He would testify when he had baptized the Son of God, that indeed he had baptized the Son of God and knew that he had baptized the Son of God. Therefore, according to Nephi, after he had baptized the Messiah with water, he should behold and bear record that he had baptized the Lamb of God. It is interesting that concerning himself, Jesus predicted that after, excuse me, concerning Jesus himself, Nephi predicts that after he was baptized, the Holy Ghost would come down and abide upon him in the form of a dove. The dove came, Nephi says, as a sign that the Savior had been obedient unto the Father in keeping his commandments, a sign to John assigned to you and I. Indeed, the Savior was given the power from God so he could go forth in his ministry. And why? Because during that 30 years, of which we have very little record, he was true and holy and faithful to God in every point. And thus, with the baptism comes the sign, yes, my son has indeed been all that I wanted to be, him to be, and therefore he is now empowered to go forth in his ministry. The Book of Mormon explains why the Father reveals so much about the Savior's baptism. First, it teaches a lesson about the condescension of God. God himself shall condescend, not just simply coming into this mortal world, but he will lay aside his, his kingly honor his godly rank, and he will become as man and more, he will condescend, God will condescend. He who is pure and holy and without fault and without sin shall condescend to be baptized by a man. Uh, just an aside, I am so impressed that if God himself 
can condescend to be led by, administered to by, go forward through the testimony of a mere mortal. Surely you and I can come under the strength of a good anointed man, no matter what his station in life may be. Christ condescended to be baptized as man, by, baptized by man, thus showing us the way that we too should submit to those whom God has called and appointed. The second point that I am impressed with, and that is, it shows us that the Son was willing to fulfill all that the Lord commanded, all that God commanded of him. The Lord had done all that had been required of him up to this point in his ministry. He couldn't stop now. He indeed had to continue to do all that the Father required, and that meant that he had to be baptized. The point, the Father required, as Nephi said, that the Son show unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. So the baptism indeed showed that the Son was fully submissive to the will of the Father. Third, Something else it does, and that is, it shows unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he having set the example before him. Indeed, he did show the way for if the Savior was holy, the scripture says, and still had to fulfill the Father's will being baptized, how much more, the prophet asks, need we, being unholy, to be baptized. Sixth point. The Book of Mormon reveals that after his baptism, the Lord would move into a ministry of tremendous blessing and power. The phrase includes going forth, ministering unto the people in power and great glory. Abinadi testified that he would go forth in mighty power upon the face of the earth. That power would manifest itself not exclusively, but often through miracles. The prophets were well aware of the breadth of those miracles, that they would include healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, the deaf to hear, the curing of all manners of diseases, says King Benjamin. Further, he shall cast out devils or uh, evil spirits which dwell in the hearts of the children of men. So it, this, this is a ministry of power. And one of the things that the Book of Mormon underscores is that we cannot overlook the importance of miracles to the Lord's ministry. They indeed show that he was, as the psalmist said, one who came with healing in his wings. A tremendously powerful testimony. Nephi saw that the miracles were not a few. He says, I beheld multitudes of people who were sick and who were afflicted with all manner of diseases and with devils and unclean spirits. And they were healed by the power of the Lamb and the devils and unclean spirits were cast out. So a tremendous, broad, far-ranging ministry of healing and blessing and lifting. Seventh, the book reveals that the Savior would do two tasks. He would come as Savior and save. He would come as redeemer, and indeed, he would redeem. Now, brothers and sisters, these two tasks, though closely related, are not identical. Salvation, or excuse me, redemption, suggests paying the price to, to get one off the slave block. In other words, to pay the price to make an individual free. You and I are sold to sin. We are sold under sin. And therefore, Christ came along and redeemed us from sin and therefore brought us into freedom. Salvation goes beyond that. Salvation means that not only have we been made free under Christ, but it carries the idea of an assurance of a wonderful future. A future that will bring happiness and contentment indeed. As the uh, Pearl of Great Price tells us, it will bring us joy and a knowledge of our God. So Christ came as Redeemer. Christ came also as Savior to bring all who would unto the Father. Just a couple more points before we move on. I'm impressed that the Book of Mormon stresses his ability to redeem us will grow out of the atonement. One aspect of that atonement means redemption is universal. 
Jacob assured his people that the redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have broken hearts and contrite spirits. Christ paid the price, the Book of Mormon assures us, with his own blood. He did it himself. Quote, his blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam. Unquote. King Benjamin taught that it covers those who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them or who have ignorantly sinned. I'd just like to pause on that one. There are no if, ands, and buts to the law of justice. Either we keep it or we don't keep it. And pleading ignorance is no plea at all. We are responsible for understanding the law. It is up to us for it's our salvation that is at stake here. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't know the law. Sometimes it is through sin. Sometimes that sin is through the sin of the fathers and therefore the word never gets down to us. Sometimes it's through our own sin, through our own sins of omission as well as sins of commission. The point is, even if we ignorantly sin, we would come under the condemnation of the law. But along came Jesus, and Jesus said, No, no, I will atone for them, and therefore their ignorance will be a salvation to them. If they're truly ignorant, I am not going to have it count against them. Therefore, even those who ignorantly sinned shall be saved under the power of Christ. King ben, or Nephi says, because, oh, this is Lehi, I'm sorry. Because of the intercession for all, all men come unto God, wherefore they stand to be judged of him according to the truth and holiness which is in him. Thus, some aspect of the redemption applies to all. But full salvation can only come on specific condition. And the Book of Mormon is very clear as to just what that condition is. He shall come into the world to redeem his people, Amulek taught, and he shall take upon him the transgression of those who believe on his name, he says. As Nephi, this is uh, Nephi the son of Helaman said, Jesus has power given to him to redeem them from their sins because of repentance. Amulek explained why it was that a person had to first repent in order to find forgiveness of sin. He says, it was because the Lord cannot save them in their sins, for I cannot deny his word. And he has said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can ye be saved except ye inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, ye cannot be saved in your sins. Notice then the power of full salvation can only come to those who are willing to give up their sins. I, I was impressed as a bishop that a lot of people viewed repentance as the penalty or the punishment that God imposed upon them because of their sin. What a horribly negative view of a wonderful principle. Here, the Book of Mormon straightens us out. It says you cannot look at repentance in such negative terms. Jesus has given you a free gift. He paid his blood for your redemption. He paid his blood for your salvation. But he cannot force upon you that salvation or that redemption. You must choose it. And how do you choose it? How do you say to God, I am willing to accept that salvation. I am willing to accept that redemption paid for so heavily by the Lord. And the answer is repent. That is the means, the way that God has given us that we may take upon ourselves truly the fullness of what Christ has promised us through his redemption. Seven. The book testifies that in spite of the good that the Lord will do, <coughs> events will turn ugly. And after all this, says King Benjamin, his enemies shall consider him a man and say that he hath a devil. Among the multitudes that come to hear him, there will be many, notice that word, there will be many who will turn away and cast him out from among them. Eventually the prophet saw that Jesus, that the Jews through fear and hatred would turn murderous against him. 
and that the son of the everlasting God will be judged by the world. The irony is absolutely striking. The one who created the world and the one who is given power to judge the world is going to be judged by the world. And not only that, the world's judgment will be an unjust judgment. And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it. And they smite him, and he suffereth. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth, because of the loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. Benjamin said to the people, And yielding to this loving kindness, shall scourge him, and shall crucify him. And in this way, he was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. Point eight. Nephi stressed that no one took the life from the Lord, but it was a gift that he freely gave. He yieldeth himself, says the prophet, according to the words of the angel as a man, into the hand of wicked men. Point nine. He would die at the hand of wicked men. I want you to notice that term. That is, a, that is a very strong term. You see, wickedness does not point to a, a simple violation of God's moral law. Wickedness suggests a conscious and deliberate violation, knowing the will of God absolutely, and then turning against it with all one's heart, with all one's passion. That's what causes one to be wicked. And wickedness carries the idea behind it of deliberately doing hurt. You can do evil without intending to hurt somebody. But when you when you decide you will hurt them, you are, a, you are being a wicked person. The book, book of Mormon makes it clear that the Jewish leadership knew what they were doing. Therefore, its prophets could say that the Messiah will come among the Jews, among those who are the more wicked part of the world, and they shall crucify him, for thus it behooveth our God. And there is none other nation on the earth that would crucify their God. For should the mighty miracles be wrought among the nations, uh, other nations, they would repent and know that he be their God, but because of priestcrafts and iniquity. They at Jerusalem shall stiffen their necks against him, that he be crucified. Due to their murderous hatred, I am sorry to say they would do more than crucify him. That would not be sufficient. But they would humiliate him and they would torture him before he ever saw the cross. Nephi chronicles what would happen. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from the shame of spitting. Further, the Lord would not fight them. He shall be led, yea, even as Isaiah said, as a sheep before the shear is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. So wicked men judged him, shamed him, tortured him, and finally crucified him says the Book of Mormon. Tenth point. The Book of Mormon prophets give the people a sign by which they would know the Lord had been crucified. Nephi explained that three days of darkness, which should be a sign given of his death unto those who inhabited the isles of the sea, more especially given to those who are of the house of Israel, he says. Uh, however, the event signaling his death would go far more than just simply beyond three days of darkness. The Book of Mormon says, The rocks of the earth shall rend, and because of the groanings of the earth, many kings of the ash of the sea shall be wrought upon by the Spirit of God to exclaim, The God of nature suffereth. Now, with that sad note, I really should end this presentation since I am dealing with the mortal ministry of the Lord and with his death his mortality and his mortal ministry come to a close. But I just have to say a little more about what happened after that death and as a result of that death. Now listen to this unique insight from the Book of Mormon. The Nephites knew, quote, after he is laid in the sepulcher for the space of three days, he shall rise from the dead, now listen, with healing in his wings. He came as healer. 
The Book of Mormon testifies of his many, many miracles that he wrought through the healing processes. That healing power did not end with his mortal ministry. It rose with him in the resurrection and therefore he still continues to move forward to heal. It is true that now much of his healing will be to heal the breach between God and man. Nonetheless, his power would be there. Through the power of the resurrection, the Father breaketh the bands of death, having gained the victory over death, giving the Son power, the son power to, make, uh, to make intercession for the children of men. Thus the Book of Mormon reveals his ministry and the power of that wonderful ministry. For you and I in the last days, we cannot be like Sherem or Korahor. We must be as Nephi and Alma and Benjamin and Abinadi and all those others who believed on the prophets and therefore were prepared for the Lord's first coming as they prepared for his first coming by listening to the prophets and knowing the signs. So too we can prepare for the second coming by listening to our prophets and watching for the signs. May we be in tune. May we watch. May we listen. May we be one. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.